I'm drinking from my wife's <laughs> college cup here. Oh, nice. I'm, I'm drinking from my, my scraggly grad student teacup I still have. Hello, the amazing everybody. Cup. Welcome to the May Design Chat. Hi, I'm Patrick Leader here for the May Design Chat. First I'm working from home today. Long time fan, first time caller. First time caller. Long time, <laughs> long time fan of Leader Games. It's weird. Uh -uh. I've designed some fan factions. I'm here to talk to you about them uh, with with the designer of uh, Root Cole Worley. Love talking uh -uh. about fan factions. <laughs> <laughs> Have you thought about putting an animal in it? Ooh, <clears throat> animal, Ooh. animal from the Muppets. Uh, yeah, yeah. We I, guess, have, uh, I, I think that, you know we could just very quickly get Kyle's sign in to just do a Muppet theme screen share. <laughs> uh, because though though it's firmly established that there are no humans in Rudiverse, there might be Muppets. Well, that's uh, there's some sort of weird amalgamation, like like they're like they're like Frankenstein Gollum, like they're like flesh Gollums, like people are really afraid of them because they don't know what they are. Uh, shrimp, shrimp faction win. Shrimp faction. No, shrimp have to be food, remember? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I have my gonger behind me <laughs> from Sesame Street. He is my favorite new character from Sesame Street, even though maybe he makes fun of accents a little bit. I don't know. Uh, but he cooks with Cookie Monster in the in the monster food truck, which is a segment they do in uh, like season 51 through 54 so we we just started watching the new ones and i am uh i think that the half an hour format works pretty well for the show it's uh your audio is a little low oh no saying. well let me yeah. boost it up uh -uh. i'm boosting my audio up it's it's my booming it's my commanding voice <laughs> taking over the right. taking over the airways we'll fix that <laughs> yeah there we go. Is this a new streaming space? Uh, it is not. It is not. Patrick happens to be home today, so we are doing it doing a, a, a call-in format. Um, uh -huh. I don't know what we're going to do with our new streaming space. That's like a, that's a summer problem. That's a that's a like yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a summer, I mean, that's a summer, that's a summer fall problem. I'm excited to get new cameras because we're using these like 1080p um, just webcams, and they are fine. But it would be nice to get a proper cam. They're like I mean like if you go to Amazon and type in webcam. It's yeah. that's what you get. It's like it's, the it's, Amazon it's, choice, least offensive to everyone works most logistic. Plug it in. Yeah. Logitech. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Um, anyway, so you like the half hour format. This is important to me. I got it. Oh yeah. Sorry. I, I think, I think the half an hour format generally works, mm -hmm. but it does something weird to the show, which it like, I, I don't know. I'm trying to think about the right way to describe it. Um, the previous show felt a lot more like a big omnibus. It was kind of like wander. Mm -hmm. There would be like multiple like mate, like, you know, plot threads. None of them were super important. The new show is much more compact in a way that I think is fine. Um, and lends itself more to like the stream where like you'll watch the next one right after it because the episodes are going to right into each other. Right. Whereas like the hour long show, you watch the Sesame street program and then you're done dial out. Yeah. Yeah. You've had your fill. Whereas the new one, it's like a little snack. Um, so unless I have mixed feelings about it. But I think unless you're three, and then you watch you watch as many hours as you can. You watch as much no one, as possible. <laughs> because you have no clock in your head. <laughs> and it could be eight at night, and then suddenly it's bedtime, and you're, like, concerned. <laughs> mm -hmm. Cool. What, new have you been, what have you been playing that is new? It's new. So I played uh, Arc Nova uh -huh. uh, this past weekend, and it was good. It's good. It's um. It's so interesting. It's just so different. It's just such a, from a different different design school, where it's obvious that someone had played, um, all of the last like ten major euros, and then they made a new one, that improves and builds upon the previous one. So like I personally like vastly prefer preferred Arc Nova to Terraforming Mars. I sure. love the theme. Uh -huh. I think that the physical production is. I mean, I think it is a well-produced game, but the, 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 they made interesting choices when it came to how the game presented itself. Um, but I also think they're very reasonable choices because if they would have like fully illustrated that game, I don't think people who haven't seen it in person would realize how much art there would be. It would be like it would cost twice as much. Sure. Um, but I think it was generally good. And then I've been playing, actually I have it with me. Um, this game, Trick Taking in Black and White, uh, which is this lovely little Japanese trick taker that is played with a two-suited deck. 
Uh, and I, a, a friend uh, gave me a copy of this when I, when I saw him a couple weekends ago. And uh, I've probably played it a dozen times, and I really, I really like it. it. I think it's one of the best simple trick takers that I've played. Because Fo Fox in the Forest, which is also a really good game, uh, d I feel like it doesn't teach you anything about trick taking. It's like its own little like weird genre, Fox mm -hmm. in the Forest genre. This mm -hmm. game will make you think about how trick taking games work, and it's great. I really, uh, really it, admire it. What is this called? It's called Trick Taking in Black and White. Trick taking in black and white, and it's great. I think that's what it's called. Why? Black why don't I know the subtitle? I mean, it's going to take ten minutes to play. We should play it in the office, right? Oh yeah, 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 hundred percent. Okay. Um, yeah, it, it is just it's going to live in the office unless I want to take it home. Yeah, it's sure. really, uh, it's really wonderful. Well, we could buy two. It looks cheap. Yeah, it's not by Oink. It's by Decoct Design, oh, which my. I don't know anything about. Interesting. I should play Ark Nova, right? We're getting. To I think, time. yeah. I mean, so what I ended up doing is I I hadn't planned on picking up a copy, but I was at a game store and I was like, you know, I kind of need to play this game, and I kind of want everyone in the office to also play it because it's it's you know we need to stay current, right? Uh, stay up on our games, so we'll 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 get some office games together. Ark, Ark Nova soon. I like that analysis of Euros. I feel like that's how I've always felt since like Agricola on. I feel like everyone just plays the last 10 and then they're like trying to find the next like trick to put into mm -hmm. the Euro. And then, so, so I took a break from it and then like Clay started showing up at the office with like talks about Orleans and Twa and, 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 and like muttering about like rules. And I was like, Oh no, did I miss a lot of development? <laughs> And so that's, and then, uh, you know, I, Terraforming Mars is a little bit lighter compared to some of those, I think. Um, and I've played that and have enjoyed and not enjoyed it for the reasons that we don't have to litigate uh, Terraforming Mars. I like it for the theme. I think it's cool. I think, I think Terraforming Mars, to me, like there are parts of the, 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 the mechanisms that I like and there are yeah. parts of the theme I like. And it is the failure to like connect right. and like do the coherent narrative work that... I think, I mean, narrative is a weird relationship to Euros because I feel like they get a reputation as not being narratively driven, but I think the real right, yeah, Euros yeah. are narratively driven. And Arc Nova, just applying that logic, the Terraforming Mars logic, um, where you're kind of like building sets of these preconditions, applying that to how a, a zoos work and zoo infrastructure is brilliant. Great idea. And it's really interesting. Well, well I'm going to I'm gonna have to give it a roll. And how young do you think you can play it? Say there was a person in my house that enjoyed animals a lot it is it's pretty heavy it, is it's it not, okay. yeah, I, I, I think it is a it is a midweight euro but mm, but it's Agri agricola yeah. is an easier lift yeah um, i uh i have that one from Uwe about the zoo i think oh, we're gonna try, um, try that yeah. the, the drafting one yeah i think we're gonna get that a try soon because of the animals so that was the one nell wanted me to buy at the game store when i yeah when we saw it too well, yeah. my, my older daughter was like, "Hey, let's uh, let's play this," and then we never played it because that's how it goes. So I've been playing uh, D and D. I just launched a new campaign. Uh, we finished uh, Waterdeep Dragon Heist, and I took that group over and I've introduced them to a new dungeon of my design, uh, based on Tony Dowler's kind of work uh, in Mega Dungeons, um, and I'm trying to run it extemporaneously as possible. So I'm just like. The encounters, I know what the next three encounters are going to be at any moment, and that's about all I know about what's going to happen next in the in the story. Uh, and that's been fun. Um, unfortunately, we had to blow the second session because a couple people couldn't make it this weekend. Um, and I have been playing... What video games have you been playing? Uh, I've been playing Slipways, which mm -hmm. I really like. Um, I'm quite bad at it. Mm -hmm. But I but I do think it's really smart and smart it's smart and good, and then I've been watching people play Tunic and thinking about playing it, uh, but I've not I've not jumped in yet. Um, oh that looks fun. I, yeah, that one looks fun, and uh, we I like Finji a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Knowing their story, they were, they came and spoke at one of the uh, glitch is that what it's called Glitch Minnesota GlitchCon, mm -hmm. 
And uh, I took them out for breakfast Sunday morning. We talked game design for a while. So it was, um, I have a special affinity for <laughs> the folks well, there. And I, I got yeah. to meet a lot of the Tunic team folks at yeah. PAX West a couple years ago. And I had just a great conversation with them. And they talked about wanting to replicate the experience of um, like buying a Japanese game and not Japanese. Trying yeah. To sort it. And I thought, what a great conceit. And that was something that really hit me because. One of my very first online purchase was a money order. Which uh-huh. I, I bought something on eBay that I had to send a money order to, and it was a Japanese copy of uh, Tactics Ogre. And mm-hmm. I played through a lot of Tactics Ogre and all of Final Fantasy V without any idea of what I was doing, using some GameFacts.com guides mm-hmm. and um, just some deduction about what the different menu buttons did. But that was like a whole... I mean, there was probably a two or three year period of my life where I was playing a bunch of Japanese uh, import RPGs without any idea what I was doing. And so the, the notion of building a game around it was compelling. Uh, That's amazing. So I've been playing um, a couple of months ago, I had this dream about where I got to play Doom and the levels were procedurally made so I could just keep playing Doom forever. Like the 1993 Doom. And I don't even, like, I don't even think the technology would be that far off if someone wanted to try something like that. Uh, so I've been playing Nightmare Reaper, which is essentially Doom with procedurally generated levels. And looter shooter mechanics because there's all the weapons are procedurally generated, um, and obviously I've fallen into a rabbit hole that <laughs> <laughs> I just love it. Even when the even when it's too hard for me, I've been able to rise. Like, I mean, that's that's the quitting point a lot, right? Is if a game gets too frustrating, and I've been able to stick with it and mm-hmm. and get better at it. And I would even I'd say now like. I'm much better at mouse aiming than I was a month ago, even because mm. I've been I've been getting better. It really rewards uh, hitbox, you know, like the hitting the right spot with hitbox. So, um, so I've been working on that, and I might even there's an achievement for playing through it three times because there's like new game plus plus plus. Like starting the new game plus 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 is the last achievement, and I totally intend on getting that achievement. So I'll work my way towards it. So, um, it. yeah. And for no, new board games, not much lately. I've been going back through um, the Onerim series because um, they just announced there will be an eighth installment or seventh installment in that series. And so I thought, what better way to celebrate that than to try and beat all the Onerim games one more time. So, oh, nice. But we've been, we've been kind of slow at home for playing new games. So I mean, I, also, I cannibalized a lot of my game time to work on Dark. So Yep, yep, that's yeah. how it goes. That's how it goes. So, all right. <laughs> Uh, Let's so, get into it. Yep, mm-hmm. studio's been crazy busy lately. Uh, Pedal to are, the metal. Yeah, we have been, it has been uh, just, I think, I, it's, it, I feel like the last few weeks have been um, consistently wishing there were more hours in the day, at least on my own part, and just uh-huh. work until I can't read what I've written and then stop, go home. Um, but everything's going great. Um, we, uh, so there's a few little things that will hit. Um, am I still quiet? Let me fix this. I'm going to turn Patrick down. Well, every time, every time he turns me down, I get louder. <laughs> All right. Well, I can't boost myself any louder than I am now. Um, maybe the problem's on your end, fancy. Ah. Um, <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, th- things are super busy here. Uh, we are in the throes of ARC's Kickstarter prep, which we'll be talking about uh, more a little bit later. Um, Kickstarter prep is one of the parts of the studio work that I think is probably um, least like talked about because you know we share things about design, we share things about upcoming projects, we share a lot of things about fulfillment because we want to know about fulfillment. We very rarely talk about the work that goes into Kickstarter prep. Uh, and it is months and months and months of work. So one thing that we did, uh, we sent out a bunch of preview kits. I actually have the last one that needs sent out right here. You can see that it's in a uh, oath, a root box, sorry. A handsome taped cover. Uh, and then the board, we just had these boards printed at um, FedEx. FedEx Kinkos or just FedEx or whatever. Um, and, you know, uh, Patty cut them and put them on a single hinge. Um, they uh, are a little bit larger. They won't quite fit, fit in the box, mostly because of how the print scales work. Um, and then inside the box, I'll just kind of show you briefly like what goes into these preview copies. Uh, you're going to get a rule book. There are some player boards that we talked. About, I talked about a little bit on the designer chat. And then mostly in the case of ARCs, it's just a lot of cards. Like this whole box, this is a root box again, just filled with cards. And then we have some 3D printed pieces, 
which is a, our, using our new office thing. And then we have to sticker all of these dice because the game uses custom battle dice. And if you were to walk in the office on any Friday over the past few weeks, you it would look like a little cottage industry, like we were running an Etsy shop or something. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty amazing. Hey, did anybody tweet about this stream? I did. Okay. I don't see it, but uh, sorry, go ahead. Uh -oh. Well, I'm gonna, I'll check it. Um, yeah, and so that is, you know, all that work, um, it, it, it's amazing. It, it, it takes just a lot of, like, physical labor to put these boxes together. And, you know, our strategy is generally we send out, like, three preview kits max. They take a lot of work, and uh, we have a pretty transparent design process. And so we, we don't – I think some, some companies want to bank on, like, making 30 preview copies and getting them out in the world – We'd rather like make three and send them to people who we really trust to give a really good opinion um, and a good sense of, of what, what the thing is. And so that's what we did here. But that, that takes a lot of work. And then, of course, we're writing copy. We're doing uh, prep work on the kits to make sure that uh, the digital kits are ready for testing uh, when the Kickstarter goes live. And then also we're doing um, a lot of graphic design. Uh, Eddie, um, Hyun is designing all the Kickstarter graphics and I'm writing copy and she's coordinating with Nelson. So there's like, there's just a lot of work happening to get everything ready. Uh, and it's amazing how uh, it ends up just taking about half of the student bandwidth to hold a Kickstarter prep. And then I, yeah. So then I was like, Hey, you guys want to play a game? And then they're like, no, no, we're busy. <laughs> no way. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I get. I think every day we've launched a Kickstarter, I get very cross because I'm just like very busy answering comments and focused. And even though I'm having a good time, I just only want to be like living in the Kickstarter comment page. Uh, and I, you know, I don't want any interruption. Um, you get sometimes you get cross four weeks before. Yeah, no, I'm I'm often I'm often just work or maybe work harder. Um, no, it's been, it's been great. It's been great to see the studio firing like this. And then, and frankly, like even like. The, like the other projects have been going strong and yeah. it's been really, really cool to watch. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So do you want, do you want to say anything about Marauder fulfillment? We just posted that update. Yeah. Let me, uh, let me go. Let me just, because I've been known to be an allergy medicine right now and I can get confused. I'm just going to go get the numbers real quick again, just to make sure I got them right. I'm, I'm pretty sure I got it right. Yep. Okay, so we're looking at North uh, North America is at forty percent uh, complete fulfillment. Still expect to be in it, uh, done at the end of June. Uh, Europe and rest of the world is um, currently uh, complete. So I guess that's that's as, that's as far as we're going to get on that. Um, there is a second b uh, b batch because I think some of the um, some of the people got miscategorized, and so we had to split uh, a couple of the orders up a little bit. And those will be at the end of May. Uh, and then Australia and New Zealand is um, things have arrived at the warehouse. Uh, we are waiting for them to staff up so that they can start uh, shipping. And mm -hmm. that should be done by early June. There's quite a few less in Australia and New Zealand. So even though they're starting later, they should be done on the same timeline as North America. And North America has just been, you know, it's a lot of people have been asking where, you know, like saying things like, "I should I be worried? I haven't received any news yet. And we said till the end of June. Yeah. That's still yeah. that's that's still eight weeks away, um, and you know we don't. There's no. There's nothing to share until the moment it's going to leave the building. So, um, and our uh, our facility there is doing a great job, uh, but one of the realities of the current you know uh, employment situation is that they can only get about five hundred to a thousand out. Um, I don't even know what that interval is. I suppose a week. A week. Yeah. Yeah, and. Um, you know that's that's just how it is, and uh, I we are, I we are addressing this in the future. Like we have we have made we have not just made plans. We have taken active steps to to expand that capacity for the next Kickstarter we do, uh, and so things things should go out in a much tighter timeline when they do start coming up. But right. that's just how it is for uh, with the partners we were working with at the time. So yeah, and it's yeah. And it's reasonable. I think you, you see folks getting their copies. You want you wonder where yours is. Just sit tight. You know they're all yeah. they're all making their way. Yep, and we're doing our best. Uh, and I, you know, it's it, most people have been patient, and that's been great. And uh, and uh, I'm I'm really happy with the work that Atlas has done. Uh, so I think we're we're cruising along. So. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, so other studio things. Um, we sort of like soft announced that we're working on an Oath expansion, which is uh, mm -hmm. something that 
been kind of humming about for a long time. Um, and I'm happy to, to sort of answer any questions people have about it and say a few little things about, about it. I, we won't go into t details. The biggest reason we're not going into details is because uh, a lot of the work isn't done yet. We're, we're just sort of figuring out basically a lot of projects, sometimes projects originate um, because there's this long incubation pro process. You think about a project for many, many months, and then suddenly it looks like we can give it some studio priority and we give it studio priority. With expansions, the initiation pro process is a little different because the, one of the first questions that needs answered is, is this a viable use of resources? Um, because we just have so much more data. Like we have a pretty good idea of how well an expansion is gonna sell. Uh, uh -huh. we, we, I think everyone's really happy with how, how well Oath has done. It's sold very strongly. It, it, makes very, it makes a lot of sense to give it an expansion. Uh, but Oath has always had this problem, which is that the natural expansion for Oath is a deck of cards. Right. But the problem with the deck of cards is we price everything based on the manufacturing cost. That's like one of the primary uh, pricing data points. And if you're just using manufacturing cost, um, it makes a nonsensical product because a deck of cards for Oath, and this would be like a new world deck that you could either shuffle into your archive or starting point, in, mm -hmm. in, um, in which case the original starting deck would go into the archive. Uh, the problem with the world deck is that's 54 pieces of art plus six new edifices, which is 12 more pieces of art, plus a lot of design time. And if we're talking about a 10 to $15 product like Cats and Dogs or Exiles and Partisans, there's just no way we can budget enough um, creative bandwidth to make that a viable project. And so well, how we've been thinking about the expansion is basically that there are these three components. Component one is the deck. Uh, and then component, the deck and some edifices, right? Purely additive, uh, just, just more stuff. Um, and certainly the system has plenty of room for, for more cards. Um, the second component of the expansion is um, kind of obvious small components. Things like uh, resin secrets that are times fives. So like slightly bigger books or maybe red books that you can use for your times fives. Uh, maybe a few extra battle dice, uh, maybe little bandit pieces. And this is the stu sort of m m material that is very easy for us to use for, to generate because the actual like ask on the creative end is like maybe a few days of work, um, but it allows us in the production cost to move it into more of a $20 product profile. And then what we're thinking about for a third um, area is what I would like to do is, um, I don't want to get too much into the specifics, but instead of talk about the kind of things I'm going to be thinking about in a couple of months when I'm really working on, on the design of this is I'm trying to imagine Oath not as a foundation for, uh, for an expansion, but as instead as one expression of a system that could be expressed in different ways. And so, for instance, certain things like the fact that the Chancellor has a reliquary. Well, maybe there are ways that when you play the Chancellor, you lose your reliquary and it's not part of the game. Maybe the way that you grant citizens in the scepter system, that's like a toggle that can be turned on and off depending on things that are happening. And I would love for the expansion to embrace some of the meta elements of the game and to give players more uh, control over how the game can grow and change. And what I told um, our, our developer and editor, Josh Yearsley, in a meeting uh, this week or last week, was that I, I want just a little bit more like Crusader Kings energy in Oath, a little bit more dynasty management, a little more um, of that setting the, 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 the grounds on which the contest is d d d decided rather than just working from the perspective of everything has to fire complete space of one. So that's just like a little sense of the direction I want to go. I don't want it to necessarily be that much more complicated. Like there are ways in which your copy of growth uh, of Oath might evolve to be something a little bit more simpler potentially. Uh, and those are the kind of questions that we're going to be uh, tangling with this, this summer. Um, growth. <laughs> For the new expansion, we'll, be, we'll call it growth. Growth. Um, so on April 1st, I posted about corner boards for Oath. Yeah. Have you thought about corner boards for Oath? We'll may be making an announcement next April 1st about the corner, <laughs> for, about corner boards for Oath. Um, uh, so uh, someone asked a question in the chat. It's a really good one, which is, uh, are there lessons from 
oath that are in arcs. And there's a very funny cycle at work here. Uh, this is a good transition to uh, future projects. Um, while I was working on oath, there were all these things that couldn't fit in the game. And that very much became the seed of the kind of storytelling strategy that's present in arcs. It's like all the stuff that oath couldn't. And now that I'm working in arcs and I know what arcs can do, there are all these things that don't fit in arcs, but might weirdly fit back in oath. Uh, and so it's been like a really lovely, like virtuous cycle where there are, there are just certain ideas that are adapted to certain forms. Uh, and that's kind of what I'm finding. Uh, uh, cool. Uh, and then uh, last, last thing to, to talk about in terms of studio news is that Patrick has been making a ton of progress on Dark. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Dark is my, anybody, as anybody doesn't know, Dark is the war game I've been working on. Um, and I, I have another studio project that we don't talk about either, but uh, um, I've been working on, so I've been juggling two projects, but one is at night and it hasn't had much studio time yet. But uh, So I've been working on Dark, that's a war game about uh, kind of D&D style villains. Uh, fighting each other for kind of the underworld, and um, I, I, I'm, I'm like still struggling to how to describe it. Uh, and you're fighting for control of dungeons, which is the which is the space in the game, and then you can build uh, common rooms in them, and then capture the rooms from each other and use the resources that the other players have built. Uh, and we've yeah, we've been. I think there was. It's been turning a lot. Uh, there's there's been a lot of consideration about how to make the victory system feel like it's part of the story, and I think we're kind of I think we're kind of hitting its stride. I haven't shown you the latest version yet. Um, so I'm like, I I'm like to... two versions behind. I think. It's, it's yeah, nice you, you missed issues. the whole flags to crowns era, and yeah. um, and now it's just crowns. And um, flags to crowns is literally what I called the update when I when I wrote it in my notes. Um, and so we're moving in that direction. And so right now, it's interesting because I think, um, to me, it's interesting. Root has the has the benefit of smaller battles because it, how the victory system works. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to start from the other side of this this problem that I've been having, and that and that is, um, so Root has smaller battles because you earn points. Every turn, hopefully, you're on, mm -hmm. on, you know, you're doing something to earn points every turn, and because of that, you can't stack up and build giant troop formations and fight and crash into each other. Because if you do that, your opponent is just going to go score points. Like they don't care yep. about your they don't care about your giant troop formation. And because of the width of combat, which makes sense within the theme that these woodland warriors are not just tearing each other to pieces in giant battles. That it's just little skirmishes here and there. Um, it works really well for that. And, um, you know, and then, you know, the downside to that system, of course, is what we call the boot problem, where, whereas uh, somebody ends a turn at 29 points and then goes either, if I'd only built one more boot this entire game, mm -hmm. I would have won. Or, worse uh, yet, <laughs> worse yet uh, you go through the entire rotation again and the person does build a boot at the start of their next turn and wins the game on a boot. And, um, and I, I, you know... Root's great. I'm not. Right. That's that's not like a, that's not like a, a detraction on Root. It's just something that uh, I I've thought about. Um, and so, um, but Dark is about the giant troop formations, and it is about the giant movement of troops. And so, one thing that the victory point system was doing, since I was using kind of a non non zero, uh, you know, everything everything on the all the points are on the board at the beginning of the game, and you're just divvying them up with your opponent. To some extent, there are some points that enter the game as the mm -hmm. game goes on, and so um, that was leading to you would go and stake a claim on some territory, and I'd feel threatened by the troops in your your attack in your kind of offensive posture. So I would build up against you, and we would continue to build up against each other and spend most of the game just kind of in this lame bidding system where we would be mustering against each other until we ran out of runway to muster troops anymore um and i i think we've gotten around it now and without really changing too much in the victory point system we're, we're mm -hmm. mostly just changing how the um how the uh we're just changing how the, the game works and so it's harder to build make those build up so Anyway, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, it, I think it's interesting because in these types of games, mm -hmm. there is a tension between, I think you, you described them as like a zero-sum 
style victory condition where there are okay. fixed goals that if you have a goal, I mm. don't. Right. And then there uh, versus uh, something that accumulates, which is like root, right? Where you're just, mm-hmm. you're, you're all, you're all getting points. And I think um, this is a tension that I, I spent a lot of time working out with oath um, because I do think that there is something narratively unsatisfying about the accumulation of victory. points. That mm-hmm. talk about why victory points suck that was given at the, at shucks a few years ago by the mm-hmm. uh, YA novelist. Um, I think I thought it was a pretty good talk, although I think he made a big mistake. Well, it was, yeah, it wasn't. A it big was mistake. polarizing. <laughs> well, it was polarizing, but so he he used Root as a, as a bad example, right? Whatever people uh-huh. cannot like Root. I'm not I'm not bothered by that. But he used Root as an example of like of of the boot problem. He's like, it's so weird that here's this game about conquest and that a player is crafting a boot and winning. And I mm-hmm. think the problem that that he was having was he was making a category error, which he was right. he was treating games like linear written narrative so right. th- the thing about root is that root roots games have climaxes they have rising actions and falling actions and all that stuff on that silly graph that you had to look at when you were in seventh grade english class mm-hmm. uh, but it doesn't happen when you necessarily want like it could be that the climactic battle in root happens halfway through the game right or it could be that it happens on the very last turn it's a photo finish or maybe it happened in the start of the game and all of and those, you didn't know it was the climatic. Thing. Yeah, and, and then and yeah. then the drama of the game is coming to realize how important that first act was. Maybe right. Um, and so I think with with, uh, with accumulation uh, systems, you're giving up like control of where the um, of where the climaxes are. And you know, one of the goals when I was working on Oath was how do you make it so the game ends right when it needs to end? It always feels uh-huh. like it's ending on a big moment. Um, and there was a lot of time spent on, on that particular problem, but it was interesting the way the campaigns worked because mm-hmm. one reason why in Oath you have to be able to target multiple sites is you have to, because you have so few actions and you're getting fewer and fewer actions as the game goes on just because you have few left. You're not getting mm-hmm. less, it's just there is less remaining. Um, because of that, you need some way to, like... Uh, you need some time compression. You need some way to reach beyond how much time you have left and make a bid that is going to affect you on this really long scale. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that allows players to like have these big swings, these big moments towards the end of the game. And in Root, you just can't do that. Um, it does, yeah. doesn't work at all. And I think, one, I think you ran into a version of this when you had the high mustering system because it was essentially a question of the, like if the combat system was favoring the attacker and defender mm-hmm. and is it favoring them somewhat evenly and then if it is too controlled and known then you're just going to get these like weird bids mm-hmm. where players are going to put themselves in defensive positions that can't really be sailed they're going to well it, it would, yeah. or it even break but it would be it would break after 15 minutes of of mustering which wasn't that's not fun you know we, we take the same action eight times in a row and then you break the, then you break it. So sorry, go ahead. No, no, you're good. You're good. I mean, that, that was basically what I was was going to say. I'm I'm also going to lower your audio more, even oh. more, Patrick. Um, they're coming up pretty even on my my little scope here, so I don't I don't know what's going on. Um, what if I what if I talk down here? Well, I'm just going <laughs> to lower you even more. Um, there we go. Ah, okay. Um, so now, so yeah. now the so now the consideration for me is I'm trying to figure out if um, now that that's kind of working, I have some more room. I now know the scope of the language I have to express the asymmetry between the character roles because it's like like we put on the chart, um, which I'll post after the stream. I'll make a new chart because I don't have it with me. It's at work, but we can. The chest of Twilight Imperium chart. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I can put that up afterwards. Um, and so it's still somewhere between Root and Twilight Imperium right now, but I'm going to lean a little bit more towards Root uh, at this point. And I think that will help. Um, I mean, it's just more fun, but it's also, I think, going to help the uh, the two-player game open up a little bit more. And that's that's where you saw those bids happening, because obviously in three or four-player, you can't, you can't just... Yeah, be, because there's a herd. You know, two yeah. players are in a fight, and then the herd will decide, you know, how to how to go into the fight. And without the only two players, you don't have that herd. 
But I did notice the two player breaking down in the right way. You know, the the that would break apart because of the differences between the factions. So I think I just need to make that a little bit more expressive. Plus, as Ted pointed out, people really like faction unique components. Um, and he was excited. I just added a die to the dragon. You know, there's a dragon character in Dark, who's one of the villains trying to take over the the under the underworld, and uh, I just added a die to him. And people were like, "Yeah, this is pretty cool. I like this die." Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, not, I... it's not the dragon die from Vast, though. So. Sorry, go ahead. I mean, it could be. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I'll see, I'll see <laughs> we we I have we have some of those in our prototype cabinet. So if you want to save yeah. a step. Uh, I'll see if um, I can work this back in. Having now stickered, I don't know, like 30 dice in the past few weeks. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so that's where I'm at. So that's one debate. And then the other debate is um, I would love it if the game was expressive enough to give each character three secret objectives mm. that you get one of at the beginning of the game. Um, I don't think there's enough room in it for 18 possible like bonus victory conditions. Um, and so then I was trying to figure out a way, a way to like draft them so that you can get something, a bonus to one of the existing systems. But I feel like that would kind of rail railroad the player a little bit too much. Plus if you get something that doesn't quite match your character's play style, um, what do you do? At, you know, like, is there one you can trade off with or something like that? So I need to, I need to answer those questions. And then how fun is the secret objective? Um, I, I think some people on the staff are really against them. I know that, you know, kind of like in Twilight Imperium, I think you like that kind of objective card. No, I mean, our, our arcs has secret objectives. Yeah, you know, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And so um, just as a, just just to create a little bit of, of a need for the player to read the other player's table presence a little bit more than they currently are. So and maybe that's something we can add in in a scenario like in the game, you know, so it's like play this game first and then now that now that you need the extra complexity of I'm, of hidden objectives here they are something so. that nick mentioned and uh we were, we were talking about the secret objectives in, in arcs and, and nick stated it so succinctly where he said you know is at what level do you want like how important is it for players to anticipate react to someone else's secret objective right and if that is important then like don't you want just like a few secret objectives but you also then right. now, yeah, now you have to de design them in such a way that you know a player can be doing one thing to mislead you about something else. And is there enough like action space? Is there enough richness in terms of your, in terms of just the amount of actions in the game to have players act and react? Uh, one game I always think about on this question is uh, Leo Colvini's Clans, mm -hmm. which is a very old game. Not very old, but it's like probably from the late '90s or early 2000s. And it's one of those games where you don't know what color players are. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think often those games are not good. Sometimes they are, though. And Clans is very good, but it's because of the game's weird movement rules where you're, like, always moving things in these, like, funny groups. You're, like, kind of grouping things up. And you're, the basic move, the basic, um, the basic actions taken in that game is one that is pretty uh, uncertain as to which color it's favoring. So there's a lot of like subtle range of like, oh yeah, he like helped a little bit of yellow there, but also a little bit of blue. And like, I don't, I have to, you know, I have to, you know, pay attention to this pretty closely. Uh, I think Veiled Fate does a reasonable job of it too. Not the mm -hmm. best, but I need like, to play it. Yeah, it, it's, it's interesting. Veiled Fate. <laughs> it's inter I, I, I think my hot take on Veiled Fate, I was talking about this with someone uh, a few weeks ago is I think Veiled Fate as a introductory, I think that the game presents itself as a very light game. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it wants to be, it, it wants to be engaged with, loved, enjoyed at this like very light level. Uh, mm -hmm. and the rules are pretty simple, but the actual deduction the game is asking you to do is fiendishly difficult and very mm -hmm. noisy. And so those things are just mismatching. And I think with four players, a cup of scotch a notepad, like a few hours, you could play a very slow and interesting and thinky game of Veiled Fate, but it's just not like a secret Hitler. It's not like a fast deduction game, which is, I think, how it kind of sells itself. Have you played Dracula's Feast? Yeah, I have. I like Dracula's Feast. I like it, but um, playing it near playing it near late thirties or early forties or yeah, whatever. Yeah, there's a lot. It, I was like, I can't remember. I don't even know what we ate for dinner tonight. Like, when, when, how am I supposed to remember? Yeah, I had a really hard time fitting it together. And I'm sure if I, you know, I last time I played it, it was like I'd been up all night with a kid or something. So mm -hmm. I'm sure if I played it again now, I'd be, I'd be okay. But same problem. 
So um, yeah, and then so if we do introduce objectives, since you're only since you're only competing for five crowns, let's say an objective is worth an extra crown. Then, if I figure out that you're going for three council votes to get an extra crown, what like how soon do I have to be able to figure that out? And then how effectively can I like not only is there the richness and the actions to block you, but how much of my time do I need to spend possibly chasing a false lead yeah. or? Uh, can I block you, and how effectively can I block that that effort to get that that fourth vote, um, or the third vote for the fourth point? Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, I so you know obviously that's just testing and balancing, uh, and we got to get in there and do it. I'm still just trying to decide if I'm going to do the secret objectives or not. So yeah, but yeah. let's play it, and then you'll say, <laughs> nah, maybe he doesn't need him. Maybe he doesn't need him. Um, maybe he doesn't it, need him. It's funny. Uh, Arcs has a lot of objectives. I think it has like forty at the moment. Uh, now mm -hmm. that that. That's not well. It depends on how you want to count it. Uh, it it's going to have a lot, but it, they're and they're all unique. But they're also not unique. And one of the things that I found when I was working on my little arcs like content style guide was like basically there's four different types of objectives. Yeah, and then they can be expressed in lots of different ways. But like, is this a fetch quest, a build quest? You know, like, is it a kill mission? I mean, th there are there are just only so many different um, arc archetypes that you can work under. And then you can say, okay, well, this is the one where you have to get X resource or this one where you have to get Y resource, but you're still dealing with like a gathering quest. Um, and, and, and I say that uh, at the same well, at the same oh, time, Facebook saying, wants to see my T-shirt, so ignore okay. me while I well, while I stand up right. a little bit. <sighs> there you go. That's a that's a Topher design, is it not? Yeah, it's a Topher design. Yeah, that's, or, that's, or that's a developer. custom a custom vast shirt. They never made more than that one, right? Or maybe yeah, it's another one. Yep. Sorry. Another go one. ahead. No, I don't. <laughs> um, no, but I was just thinking, like, I think um, you know, it's okay if you're going into a space of saying I need to design, you know, eighteen different victory conditions. Uh -huh. That they that they share things. They don't all need to be like blazing. That's it's, true. It's yeah. all right, you know. Be, and I, I I think that arcs in some respects is the most flexible system I've ever designed. It is mm -hmm. designing cards for arcs is so fun because it it just it it makes you feel smart when you're doing it because you're like, oh, that's a good idea for a card. That's a good idea for a card too. That's cute. There's just a there's so it's like a little bag of Legos. There's like so many different ways you can stick them together. I want to be smart, feel smart. Um, yeah, and so maybe we just have to do half. Like, you need two council votes and control of three red territories, or or something like that. So, and just yeah. compound them a little bit. I like so. What's interesting to me about arcs, and I live in terror when I play it, is, um, boy, is it like a thirty or points? So the average score is around twenty, right? Yeah, yeah. You're and I've scored smart. seven or eight off of a hidden objective, and so it's like. Gosh, if I miss this, I'm. <laughs> yeah, be, yeah. And, and what what we've added since last time you've played it is, uh -huh. and we're, we're talking primarily about the single session game. Um, what yeah. we've added yeah. since then is a final victory condition that you know at the very start of the game you say like, okay, this is the, this game's theme is this, and it's going to be worth a lot of points. And what ends up happening is is if you miss your your secret objective, you either need a big lead in points. Mm -hmm. Or you need to have nailed that final victory condition. Right, yeah. And that will kind of like counterbalance it. So it's sort of like, you know, you can get a big lead, you can, mm -hmm. you know, have your your secret victory condition, or you can nail your 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 personal victory condition, and you kind of need like one and a half of those three. And it's uh, and that's cool because then it's like there's tension about the you know, if if you're one of the players that went for it, now you're like, okay, well now am I gonna get buried by somebody who yeah. Who pulled it off? So and, and, and that that's... works very different from how the how the campaign scoring works. Well, the campaign scoring is much more of a combination of zero sum. And... <laughs> um, what about the arc keeper? The arc, <laughs> the arc keeper. <laughs> Quiet, Mar. <laughs> Quiet. Um... I love it. All right. Uh, so yeah. So thank you. I think we'll uh, you know we'll just uh, give it a try in office. And... Yeah, I mean I'm excited to keep, to keep tightening it. I need. I do need a little bit more. Um, currently, I keep mentioning council votes, but I think that just needs a little bit more counter, like ability to counterplay. Um, but everything else is hitting the right, like mm. good, like good. Like I almost won on Saturday on uh, on the invasion. Like I was going to get the crown for invading the 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 world, and uh, uh, the players just all just squish me from fifteen guys on the board to like eight. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, so it was fun. All right, cool. Uh, 
You want to talk about anything else today? Well, we've got one thing to talk about. One last thing. Actually, that's not true. We've got two things. Uh, one, oh, no. Okay. One, I forgot to mention in the studio chat, um, we're based in Minneapolis, well, St. Paul. We're based in the Twin Cities, and we are sponsors of the Tabletop Market, which is on May 14th. I just forgot to mention. And if you live in the Twin Cities, consider going to the Tabletop Market. It is a delight. It is on May 14th. It is from noon to 3 at the Minneapolis Cider Company. Can I sell it, games there? You can sell games there, but I think all the tables are sold out, so you can ask me to sell your games for you. I'll just I, put them I, on I have, someone I have table. Very, I have very reasonable commissions, but the, the, one, the one danger of selling games with me is I will get rid of everything. I like to, uh, I don't label things individually. I just put category signs, and as the, as the day goes on, I just slide everything into the free category. My, uh, my, my money can go right to Doctors Without Borders. I, I just want them out, I just yeah, want them out of my out house. Out of your house, yeah. yeah. Well, what I'll probably do is bring a few bins to the office. Anybody who wants to dump games, I'll, I'll, I'll move them. But if you uh, are in the Twin Cities and you're in the Twin Cities, it's wonderful. And there are so many good deals, and it's lovely to see people and a bunch of the local companies uh, out here sponsor it. Uh, and it's run by a friend of the studio, a friend of the studio who has done a lot of good um, playtesting for us, and we like lo love to see the tabletop market thriving. Um, can, I, can I plug my public outreach then? Yes, yes, you may. Um, so SB Shaman, who's in the, who's in the, uh, maybe we can post a link. He's doing the root jam through Woodland Wires, so it's two weeks to work on a fan, some fan content, and he is putting um, ten dollars. Someone in my backyard. Um, he's putting ten dollars towards Doctors Without Borders for every entry in the um, into root jam. So every fan faction or whatever that people work at next two weeks. The theme is, I believe, twins. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Or, or yeah, something or like that, right? Duality or something like that. Uh, and then, and then there is also a ten a bonus ten dollars if you play it a certain number of times. I can't remember the rules. Um, anyway, I have off uh, all that money is going to Darks Without Borders, and I have offered to double SB Charmin's uh, contribution also. So. Oh, yeah, it takes two is the theme. It takes two. There we it. go. Yeah, th you know. Sorry, cold medicine, or uh, I mean, allergy medicine. I can't even remember. What you I got mean. close. You got close. I, I was close. Yeah. All right. So, any okay. other things we want to talk Last about? Last thing. Uh, we are happy to announce that the Arcs Kickstarter will go live on May twenty fourth this year. <laughs> <laughs> Spaceship just flew across the screen, Patrick. Ah, uh, 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 dang it! I was looking at I was looking at the wrong thing. Um, I told um, Cole I was going to read the URL out loud. Yeah. Um, as if I were a, uh, a computer science professor from 2001. So here we go. No, we'll, we'll do that. We'll we'll post the link. <laughs> um, yeah, we are so thrilled. Um, you know, these kickstarters take a really really long time to get off the ground. Um, this product has been cooking for a real for. I mean, it's almost as long as Oath, Oath cooked, and we can't wait to show everybody the page. Um, so we will run it. I mean, I can say a few things about the Kickstarter page. Um, it will launch in the morning, around the time we usually launch them, uh -huh. probably. Um, no, no trickery or tomfoolery. We've got no stretch goals, no, like, pre-launch swag. There's no weird promotionals. It's as straight as an arrow. Um and uh, what we've done with this product is interesting, and we have not finalized our pricing. There's a few things that we're, we're, we're still figuring out, but I want to just say a word about how this Kickstarter is structured and the way it is structured, um, the way it's structured. Uh, there will not be a two-player mode, <laughs> I'll just say. No, no bots. We're already at 50 followers. Excellent. <laughs> there are at least, you know, there are at least 38 of you watching this. Excellent. Perfect. Uh -huh. um, so I'll say a little bit about the, the product, uh, product design. Uh, so ARCS is a huge, huge project. In some respects, it is like as big as Oath um, and as demanding as Oath in terms of uh, the design, the art, the product design, uh, the development, the editorial. There's, there's a lot in, in the box. There's just a ton of content. And what we realized when we took the game to testing. So uh, ARCS has been an interesting thing to develop because um, there is so much content to develop that with Oath, um, I knew there was a lot of content, but I also kept the system, the Oath system, pretty loose until very, very, very late in the development. So playtesters may remember their different combat systems or the court system or all sorts of stuff. And that was done on purpose because I wanted to make sure that all, you know, 250 card effects 
they all harmonized with the core system. ARCs is a little different because it is a lot more demanding to make content for ARCs. And so to do that, I have to act a little bit more like a video game designer. And so like uh, the, the work of the last year has been designing this engine. And then once we have the engine, we build content within the engine. Um, and, you know, the game was always designed uh, for campaign play, but that core engine got just a lot of attention. And so we, we worked on the engine for eight months, 10 months, a year, and then we started adding the campaign content. And then when I started taking it for public testing, what I found was that players who jumped into the full campaign uh, were overwhelmed, which is a weird thing because the design is, in some respects, simpler than Root. But when players would jump in for the first time, there was just so much to do. It unveils itself so slowly, though. But, I, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, but, I but there were all these things that were supposed to make it easy. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and so I found like, okay, well, I, I could just do the thing we did with Oath, which is say, everybody suck it, play two times, you'll figure it out, and then it'll be good. Um, but I, I was also just sort of like haunted by this, like, wow, we made like another giant game with a big... Uh, with a big l l learning curve in it. And um, I Kyle said something to me, which, I, which really resonated, which is that like when we were at shows, he loved like being able to give someone a copy, or not give, but like sell someone a copy of Root and saying, hey, like go play this game like tonight. Like you could do it, like you could take it out of the box and just play it. Um, and I thought it's a bummer. I mean, I love Oath, but you can't really do that with Oath. Oath is not a game that you can buy on the floor of Gen Con and then go play it in some hotel, hotel corridor in the way that mm -hmm. people can play Root. And so I started thinking about, well, if the engine is so solid, is there a way that we can make a single session version of ARCs that we could say, hey, you might be unsure about this giant game. Here's the single session version of the game. Um, and what we found when I stripped out the campaign elements is that single session works really, really well. Mm -hmm. Like it is a fully featured game. Uh, when I taught it to people this weekend, one of them said that it felt like a really distilled version of Eclipse. That like, if, you know, if Eclipse is a distilled version of TI, like this is a further distillation, like a really clean game. And so I thought, you know, I, I had always thought that ARCs had, had one major claim to urgency, one major reason why it existed, which is that most campaign games aren't designed to be campaign games. It's a weird quirk of, of, of the, the board game world, right? That like the major legacy games are adaptations of single session games in a campaign structure. Like Pandemic Legacy was not designed to be a, or Pandemic was not designed to be a campaign game. It just happens to have been the most successful campaign game. Right. And tabletop. And so with ARCs, the primary urgency was, what if you went into the design of something with the, the, the knowledge that this was built to be a campaign game? And then it would enable all this, these new storytelling things that you couldn't do. I mean, Tilda uh, joked, um, uh, jokingly said, like, could you be, uh, play Dune within ARCs? And I'm, I was just working on a faction that replicated some of the zero-sum emperor economies that mm. like turns on like a little switch in the game. So like sort of, but that was always one urgency, like a campaign game that is really a campaign game first. But I think the second urgency of arcs is, can you build a really good, like let's say $70 game, like roughly root priced game that is easy to learn, easy to pick up and can give you those big, you know, you can get a really good, interesting space game without having to like buy a Twilight Imperium or an Eclipse. And so one thing I actually want to show on that is um, this thing right here. So this is part of our, um, our rulebook design. So th this is the rulebook for ARCs. Um, it's the size of the Ahoy rulebook. Uh, it's about 20 pages. Um, and, you know, this spread right here, the action spread, these are almost all the actions in the game. And it's just on a little like half sheet of paper. Uh, very I'll, easy. I'll ask him several times what they do during the game, but yeah, yeah, yeah but it's very, it's very like small, easy, manageable rule book. And then uh, we'll have a few of these player aids and the player aids, this is a single sheet of paper. And so here's like the structure of a round and here are the actions. And then here's how the end of the hand, like upkeep phase works. And that's everything. And so you can, you can really teach this game in about 10 to 15 minutes. And by teach, I mean like the players know everything. Um, and so because ARCs works so well in that shorter format, what we've decided to do is sort of break the product up a little bit. 
And there'll be a pledge level that will give you arcs, that will give you the single session, good space game, pretty, a pretty reasonable price. And then for the people who want the campaign, there is a price that is around the, the price of the Oath Pledge that gives you the base game plus all the campaign stuff. Um, and that is like over 200 additional cards. It's a bunch of extra pieces. It's a larger board. There's a lot of other elements. Um, a lot of other elements to, to, to how, how that works. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to, to, to say a word about that. So the, the way that this Kickstarter is going to present itself is players who are unsure if they've got a, the kind of group that's going to really s support their exploration of arcs, there's still a way that they can engage with, with the game. That's fine. Uh, and then if the people who want to like really jump right into the campaign stuff, well, the, the path is, is laid out. Uh, and then the other thing I'll mention about the campaign before I forget is we will, of course, be launching the campaign with a print and play and with a, uh, with a couple of digital mods. We have one for Tabletop Simulator and for one for uh, Tabletop Playground, and all of those will launch. Um, we are only going to be launching, though, those print and plays are only going to be the single session version of ARCs because the campaign is too big and there are parts of it that aren't done yet. And so, but we do want to show y'all how the campaign works. So most of the designer diaries I'm writing are tuned to the campaign and we will be doing a campaign playthrough over the course of the campaign so people can see how it works. Okay, now we can answer questions. Sorry, that was a, a longer- No, it was um, amazing. I'm, I'm breathless. And like too. that, this decision and frankly the campaign have represented a lot of miss sleep. So everybody should appreciate it. <laughs> there's a lot that campaign i haven't done anything for it yet i mean i there's talk that i might design one of the mm -hmm. uh, campaign expansions um which we should circle about because i've had some ideas for it oh yeah uh but uh but not right now because we're on a live mic um yeah it, it's it, it was it was it's a it's been a huge commitment in terms of your time and uh josh and next time to like do and to make, you know, like even just learning how to build open world content. So, um, I, you know, there's a lot that that product represents so much design time, almost so much more than than a lot of other things that we've done. So uh, it's it's great. I, I, I think the you're all going to be getting a great value uh, with that with that uh, content. So, yeah, I'm, I'm so excited for folks to like start playing this game. In fact, I, I have this week I, I'm, I'm going to be teaching several people, including some folks in this chat um how to play the game and then i'm teaching more people thursday and i, I haven't played a campaign in a while i know well so what we did we only made this split uh about a month and a half ago or so yeah um and it, it it's a testament to where the game was that it was actually very easy once once yeah. i mean it, it just took a couple of weeks of, of some hard thinking um and then a lot of testing and some iteration but uh basically what what we did uh, on the dev side is we said okay Let's let's once we do the split, once it proved viable, we put a lot of effort in finishing it. So this Kickstarter, oh boy, I'm gonna say something like a like a monkey's paw is gonna close when I say this or something. Um this game is so much farther along than any project I have ever ever helped on a Kickstarter for. <laughs> um, I mean it, it's just it is so like um I, that is the most cursed thing you've ever said. Yeah, no, it is. So people ask, like, I wonder if the combat's going to change much. I'm like, well, there are some, like, little adjustments I'm, I'm thinking of adding for the combat right now, but they are so small. Um, the action system has stayed basically consistent since, um, I don't know, last October. Mm -hmm. um, the map has been consistent since about November. Um, so the, the, there's, I mean, and of course, you know, we're moving planets around, we're changing special powers, we're doing stuff like right. that. Um, but it's very important. And so th this is why I feel comfortable saying this because of the, de the development ask of generating the content for the campaign, it is very important that the core system is robust and strong. So this core system started emerging and becoming like kind of playable and interesting, um, not a year ago, but like, let's say 10 months ago. And in a normal world, we would have got that thing on Kickstarter right away because we knew that the core system was close enough that we, that we could show it. The hooks were in place. Let's, let's kick it up on Kickstarter and then we'll worry about finishing the development post Kickstarter. But because there's so much campaign content that needs generated, we basically chose to add about six months to the pre-Kickstarter time 
to really firm up all of the, the core design elements so that now basically we can go into the campaign with knowing all the tools that we have. So right. you know, the, 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 the line that, that I give when I talk to, to Nick or Josh, other folks in dev meetings is, do you think you can finish the game with all the tools that you currently have? And we are now past that line, like well past that line for ARCs, where like all the content can be finished with the existing, existing tool. Um, and uh, yes, <laughs> Monkey Paw <laughs> team confirmed. Um, how many factions to choose? We'll get to all that nonsense. Um, let me, uh, wait, well, there was a really good question about, can't remember. Oh, somebody asked about total cards. So yeah, so I was going to round all this up. So basically what we did uh, about six weeks ago when we broke the versions is once, it's about four weeks ago, actually, once the small arcs version became clearly viable, I basically paused work on the campaign and started just working on small arcs to get it very, very, very uh, so there's a lot to explore. Like I've played, I think probably 10 games of small arcs in the past two weeks and I've really enjoyed it and would really just be happy to continue playing small arcs. Someone on staff said the other day, it's too bad you've been talking about this campaign mode because we should have just made small. We, we should have just made the single session arcs because it's plenty of game. Um, but I think that the campaign mode is still urgent and really important. It's the part that I'm really excited about. Um, and so I'm certainly glad that, that, that we're doing it. Uh, but it means that in terms of showing the game, we don't want to quite like throw everybody into the full campaign quite yet. Uh, what I'm imagining will happen is we will launch with our with, with our single session arcs kit. You can build your own kit. You can play it online. Uh, and then probably after the campaign in a, in a month or two, we will have an updated kit that might include a small slice of the campaign for people who want to play it. Uh, and then, and then of course we'll, we'll have a full, a full kit for everybody else uh, as the game comes out. Now the question about the number of cards, um, I think the game is going to have about 300 or 350 cards. They will almost certainly all be poker sized. Um, none of this stuff is finalized yet. We very likely are not going to do custom sleeves uh, because they've gotten kind of expensive and we just didn't want to uh, put a bunch of plastic, especially that kind of plastic. Um, Paul won't let me go above 100 cards for Dark. Yeah. It's just cruel that he's using three. I've years. taken all the cards. Um, <laughs> and and I, I should say before folks get too worried about that, uh, not all these cards are going to have unique illustrations. My goodness, uh, many of them won't. Um, the art ask for this game is probably in total about half that of oaths. It, but it's half that in oaths in terms of the individual illustrations. I think in terms of difficulty of presentation and like the questions about color space and design, this is a challenging pro project for everybody who's working on it, most especially Kyle, who's like done a fantastic job doing all this stuff. I mean, like, look at this ship. Oh, when it's people great. ask, is it resettable? Yes. You're basically resetting the start of each session anyway. Yeah, or, like, well... Yeah, so, it's not like both where it's evolving. Yeah, so every campaign yeah. will, will take its game state directly from the previous game to the next one. So this actually does a really lovely thing to the end game because it means if you have a few spare actions at the end of the game and you're not sure what to do, like, yeah. I don't know, research something, consolidate your forces or split them up. It doesn't matter because, or it does matter. But every decision you make matters because it's going to directly inform the setup for the next game. Um, but after you're done with a campaign, you put everything in the, ba in the back of the box and it resets basically to factory default. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what I was getting at. Yeah, is yeah. that you? Yeah, is that at the end of that sure. that campaign? So there isn't really this concept of resetting is not really. It has to be able to reset. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. There's yeah. no stickers or anything like that. Um, I think we're still working on the precise way that players should record their board position. Uh, there are a couple of few. There are a few options, but um, I just want to do, spend some time testing them. Yeah, and that we there really isn't a card budget. I, I was just joking. Obviously. Yeah, 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 yeah. He could, he could put <laughs> as big cards as he wants in this I, game. I'm trying to keep dark under. Four decks or under five decks, so at four decks. That's 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 my goal. So, all right. Single session of arcs, just called line. Mm -hmm. nice. <laughs> uh, are those the player colors? Um, player colors right now are they're really beautiful. Uh, it's a low. I love the blue especially, but it's a blue, yellow, red, and white. Um, and if I, you haven't seen it yet, go track down the picture of all the meeples panda posted for root. Cole is 
Not cool. Sorry. Not cool. You're a master, but Kyle's a master at picking colors. No, they're so beautiful. And yeah. I, um, we have like, in terms of the, 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 the we are going to do, so I'll, I'll say something about the, the pieces for the game. Um, we have the preliminary designs for the wood. I love them. I think they're great. Uh, they're like right in that middle ground between like naval battle fleet Gothic and like kind of abstracted spaceships. I think Kyle did a great job on the and I, I could see them being final. We're not going to screen print them because there's too much stuff in the box. The, uh, the, the, the box for uh, Small Arcs is like already basically over budget. A, there's so much content in it. Um, so we certainly can't screen print the, the minis. For people who want fancy pieces, we will almost certainly be offering miniatures this campaign. And the miniature designs are. So we'll say more about them. More about them later. Um, yeah. All right, cool. Any final, final questions? Um, oh yeah. When I talk about packets being opened, I actually, I'll answer, um, slug faces question. When I talk about packets being opened, what I'm really saying is like, there's, there's, so there's an, this vault, which has all the cards. You, you open up the box, it has dividers in it. And then the dividers inside the dividers is just a brick of cards. And then the packets are just a cover sheet. And then a number of cards that goes to the next cover sheet. They're not like physically opened. It's, I'm just using the phrase metaphorical um will there be space badgers maybe uh price yet um the we have not finalized prices we're still waiting for our quotes um i will say that this is priced using the same logic that prices all of our game i think my guess is it will be a little bit more expensive than root because prices have gone up and because there's more stuff in it than root and then i would guess the campaign expansion will be similar to a large root expansion or a little bit more because a lot of stuff. And we will of course have some very nice storage solution that we'll figure out, but all that is stuff that we're still working. Um, I'm going to just tell they, that they love me. Oh, sweet. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And, and for, for the card storage, uh, instead of doing a plastic box we're we're hoping to use a telescoping cardboard box, like a magic fat pack that we can use to like, you know, it will all stay in there. Um, and, and you know, one, one thing I really like about the oath insert is you can store the oath insert basically any direction, almost any direction, and it will still hold all these pieces in place. And so we're going to be. Yeah. Um, thanks, Alf. Alpha. And we're um, working on. Oh, yeah. I can't really talk about the plastic, can I? We yeah, it's, it's, it's well, we just don't know if we have anything fun to announce about it yet. That's the yeah, thing. We're doing, we're doing what we're um, doing. There will be a board. The uh, the board for base arcs is a four panel board, so it's a it's a little. It's actually smaller than the root board, um, and the full campaign game uses a six panel board. Um, yeah, no no exclusives. Uh, asymmetry really won't be emergent during the yeah, yeah single you, game. Yeah, yeah. You you start very much all in the same spot, and then by the end of the game, my hope is sometimes you're as different as different. Um, Player positions in vast. Um, you know, you can have very, very different goals, very different abilities. If you're interested in how some of that emergent asymmetry works, that was the subject of today's. Uh, uh, yeah. Is the release date aimed for 2023? Uh, yes, because it's 2022 yeah. now. I haven't looked at the calendar. That's yeah, a yeah. I had, a moment, I had a moment where I was like, hover <laughs> I over like, calendar. I had to think about it. Like, oh, hold on, let me. <laughs> um, can you play small arcs with a long arc also going on? Uh, uh, maybe I don't have a good answer for that. It, um, there is one thing that would make it a little tricky, but we might be able to figure out a way around that. Um, oh, and one very, very important thing, um, that's different. Uh, arcs is very different from oath in oath. It doesn't matter who's sitting in the player position in arcs. It does. Um, you kind of need the same group to play each role because you're rolling directly into the next one. Now you could yeah. sub out, just know that they are inheriting all of the problems of the player who sitting in that seat before um yeah so our our hope w- with this game's production and this is just an internal hope is that we have it into production before chinese uh before lunar new year next year um you know it, that that's almost a year away it is hard to gauge these things precisely but so who knows but i i we are shooting for a 20 20- i'm gonna just assume ted the shred is uh our ted was a corpse 
Uh, is single arcs playable on the larger board? Uh, no, use the smaller board for single session. Uh, cool. I have no accountant. All right, cool. I think that's I think that's it. Um, oh, will the TDS mod be uh, updated along with game progression? Yes, we keep our mods uh, pretty up to date. Um, and the, how we're going to do the mod updating is there will be a single session mod. And then we will either have a big combo mod or there'll just be a separate, separate mod that will have the campaign. Those will be posted. Uh, campaign. Oh. Um, all right. That's it for us. Um, as always, thank y'all. We are so excited to show you more about this game. Uh, and we will be doing uh, designer. Ch I'll be doing designer diaries uh, for the next few weeks, probably leading up to the campaign, unless I give up because there's, so much to do um and uh and then when the campaign launches we've got streams art streams design streams campaign playthroughs sponsored streams and tons of other stuff so you will one of the things i love about how uh the campaigns are run at leader games is that as soon as we launch the campaign uh everybody gets to play the game and we're certainly gonna be doing that uh this time too well all right all right well That's take care everybody up. Take and care. We'll see you all later.